morning and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good morning to the West Coast viewers. Good afternoon to everyone else. <laughs> Thanks for coming to our Comarts I Talk today. My name is Meredith Jagudis. I am the Senior Director of Development in the College of Communication Arts and Sciences at MSU, a college devoted to storytelling and the way we communicate. So just as background, as MSU quickly moved to online instruction this spring, we also watched our alumni quickly adapt and pivot. And we discovered that people are really interested in some of the behind the scenes aspects of different commerce side careers. Um, so that launched this series about media and communication careers pivoting in the pandemic and leads us to today's fourth commerce side talk, Inside Production. So we're excited to be able to provide this opportunity and conversation. Thanks so much for the several questions submitted in advance. Our attendees will note that your microphone and video camera will be off, but we encourage you to ask questions throughout the talk with the Q&A function and we'll moderate that as we go. Also make sure on social media you're tagging us with hashtag ComArtsiTalks today. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our host for the hour. Jerry Zeldis is a tenured professor in the School of Journalism with not only an accomplished academic CV, but also a robust IMDb profile. She has been a professor in the School of Journalism for nearly 20 years after receiving her PhD from the college. And as both an academic and a practitioner, she has a dozen best paper awards from international communication associations, over 100 honors and screenings from documentary films and other creative work, including two national best of festival awards, four regional Emmys, and many other professional awards. So clearly she also could have sat on this panel today, but we're gonna tap into her faculty skills to moderate the conversation. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry to introduce our panel. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. That, um... I don't know who that person was, but I really appreciate a rundown of um, what you shared just now. I want to thank you, Meredith and Rachel and Melissa and Jordan for putting this together because MSU, that's its mission. It's its mission to share its knowledge. And I think this Comart Sci uh, talk is an expression of, uh, of that mission. So um, one of the pieces of outreach that I, I'd love to get involved in is reaching out to alumni. So I want to go ahead and introduce our amazing alumni in alphabetical order. First, Catherine Rosso, graduated from MSU in 1996 with degrees in communication and political science. She is the executive producer of the Smirk Connor Show that airs on CNN and on CNN International One. It's one of the network's highest rated programs on Saturday. She's also worked on a, as a senior producer of other shows, CNN Tonight with Don Lemon, Pierce Morgan Live, and Aaron Burnett out front. Before joining CNN uh, in 2011, Catherine worked for other places, other networks, the ABC News Program 2020, CBS Newspath, MSNBC, and the Fox News Channel, where Catherine won awards for her breaking news coverage of the September 11th attacks. Catherine grew up in Ortonville, Michigan. Um, uh, Ortonville is a little north of me right now. I live in West Bloomfield. And right now you live in um, West New York with your husband, Randy, who's also an MSU alum, and your two children, Reagan and Jack. So uh, welcome Catherine from New York. Our next uh, esteemed alum is Greg Harrison, and he's coming to us from LA. Uh, he graduated in 1991 from Comart Sci's Department of Telecommunication at that time. Now it's Media and Information. Yep. As Creative Officer of Motion, an advertisement agency specializing in trailers for films and TV, Greg and his teams have created award winning spots for Amazon, HBO, Netflix, which is my favorite, especially in COVID, Showtime, FX, and A&E. Greg's directed um, some, uh, some top-level talent, Neil Patrick Harris, Larry David, Jessica Alba, John Stewart, Will Ferrell, and many, many more. Motions earned more than 150 major industry awards. 
Um, Greg, you grew up in Sterling Heights, is that right? I did. All right. Good morning. Mile, if anybody knows the, the mile streets. Okay. I, yeah, yeah, very close. I, I'm familiar with that area. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, coming by so early in the morning. Good yeah. morning to you. And then Richard Isako, is that correct, Isako? Yeah. Graduated in 2005 from ComArtSci, also from the Telecom Now Media and Information Department. You're joining us as well from California. You're the senior producer at the NFM Network in LA, and you produce the network's pregame show, NFL Game Day Morning, and, and you produce the pre and post game shows for, this, for the last seven Super Bowls. During the off season, you help cover the NFL draft, as well as the daily show, NFL Total Access. I'm almost out of breath here. Before working for the NFL Network, um, you were part of the original production team that launched the MLB Network, where you, you won three Emmys and you produced uh, MLB Tonight. You grew up in suburban Detroit, and um, again, joining us live from LA, uh, you have a spouse um, who is also an MSU grad. Her name is Alana, and you have two kids, so good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for being here, everybody. So I'll ask the first question, and then we'll go to questions submitted by alumni and via Zoom. Um, so I wanted to start off with, um, a, you know, paint us a picture of what your studios were like, um, during the first few days of COVID. Take us back to mid-March, what happened, and then proceed to let us know how that evolved and changed, and, and what is it like to produce your content today? So who would like to go first? Greg. I'm happy, I'm happy to jump in, if okay. you like. Yep. Um, well, uh, we have two offices in Los Angeles and uh, around 180 employees uh, between those two offices. Uh, with 45 edit bays um, and design stations and uh, producers, creative directors, designers, so, and, and a full finishing group. So a lot of technology, a lot of bays. Um, and uh, on the production side, we were in the midst of about eight productions uh, in probably eight different cities around the country. Um, and so uh, we started to see uh, I guess the quarantine coming. We, 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 we heard rumblings of it. We started to talk internally about what the impact would be. But really, um, I know we talked about this a little in, in our uh, pre-call, was I think everybody had to pivot incredibly fast. So I think in less than two weeks, we had gotten the entire staff into their homes, all the edit bays off uh, site, uh, upgraded our network and communication technology, um, it really was uh, I, our, our IT and operations group needs an award for uh, for mobilizing uh, the entire company offsite. So within about ten days, we were fully operational offsite. Uh, unfortunately, yes, the, a big impact is physical production. So um, you know we saw a lot of our clients um, both on the marketing side because we do a lot of original content to launch shows and films. Um, a lot of our original content shoots were postponed or pushed. Uh, all due to films and shows shutting down. You know, I mean, the, the really uh, production couldn't be more anti-pandemic. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's basically um, hundreds of people gathered in tight spaces working on deadlines. So um, that was a huge impact to our business and, and how we would uh, interact with our clients and the needs of our clients, how they were gonna get their marketing done or their shows done radically shifted creatively. So that was that was important to pivot as well, which maybe we can talk about in a bit. But I would say that's the overview in terms of um, having to shift our focus and, and shift our kind of technical infrastructure so quickly. Mm -hmm. So have you picked up then production on those um, eight cities, eight, eight, eight projects? And, and do, you, uh, do you anticipate being able to finish them um, in the short term or long term? Some have pushed into the fall. Uh, others have just uh, completely evolved creatively. Um, we have just begun some new remote production protocols. So we're able to direct remotely, uh, remote location scout. Um, we have built out kind of a, 
a uh, production safety guide for our clients to be able to engage in physical production that's in line with local and state governments uh, recommendations. And that's just starting to happen. We just had our first two shoots that were remote. Uh, but the creative did shift. It had to get simplified because it's usually 10 or less people on it in any given location. Um, so some of the larger shoots where we have 100 crew members, that, that's obviously got to be delayed until that, that comes back. Um, but a, another big part was shifting to design, illustration, um, focusing on post-production solutions, editing with pre-existing footage, um, some of that original content that requires shooting and working with the talent for custom content had to be rethought with, uh, with uh, different skill sets. So uh, our design group and our editorial group really has seen a spike in adapting our creative as, as we move forward. Um, but like I say, there's just the beginning of being able to shoot again, um, but it looks very, very different now how to shoot, at least, at least for the coming months, I think it'll be uh, very restricted. Okay. Those 100 person crews, do you see returning to um, that size of crews in, in the near future? Uh, well, certain, certain shows and uh, certain of our clients really do have the ambition to be, um, to produce really high level original content and commercials for their show launches. So I do think the ambition is still there. I think the big question will be when it is safe to go back um, as mandated by the state governments. Um, really, mm -hmm. you know, we're shooting a lot in Toronto and Vancouver and New York uh, and in LA. So we're really just monitoring how they're gonna phase back in production and what the protocols are. We have seen some things happening overseas where they're farther along and there's some really innovative ways to design the crew with redundancy and kind of safeguards making quadrants of productions such that you know if one quadrant that someone is sick in the quadrant they've never interacted with the other four quadrants and there's redundant crew capabilities so you can shut down one quadrant and the production can still continue so i, I feel like for the larger scale productions to come back there's going to have to be a rethinking of the safety until until there really is uh, a treatment or a cure. I, I have a feeling that, that the large scale productions won't look like what we've known them to be up till now mm -hmm. uh, for quite some time. A vaccination. Catherine, yes. could you backpedal and take us back to mid-March in CNN? Yeah, it was amazing how fast an industry where you think you can't, you know, live television, you can't, you can't go from home or work from home and how fast the industry changed within a week. I mean, our network uh, gave out three to 4,000 laptops because we all had to work from home, but had to be on company, what, you know, company laptops. So just how fast that transition was and how I thought the impossible, like how you do live shows with all that we deal with, with the breaking news coming in and changes, and we're all doing it from home. It's, 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 it's incredible. And just how fast the industry is changing because of it. Now, I still go in once a week because I do a live show, but it's interactive. My anchor talks to me. So, but the rest of my staff is at home. And it, it has its own challenges, um, but somehow we're making it at work. And um, Richard can also speak on, he's doing it, you're doing it from the control room all from home. Yeah, I mean, our whole thing, the NFL is kind of built on tentpole events in the off season. And in the middle of our free agency uh, coverage, which is, a five, it was five days, 12 hours a day, was March, March 18th, I think, is when free agency opened. So a few days before that, uh, we started making adjustments in, in our control room in LA uh, where the talent, no one could be on set together. There was a, a talent in basically different, different cameras in different rooms, but the control room was still, you know, uh, we were using the same things. There were shift changes. It, we, they gave us our own headsets for the first time, but it still was not the best, uh, best way to do it. By the end of that week, we were working from home. So it would happen quickly, but they had to adjust and it's been a whole um, evolution since then. So at first there was half hour uh, tape shows that we were doing for our daily shows where uh, producer was on the phone and with the uh, conference line with uh, the people who are on air, they would tape segments from their home cams. That we've had home cams in people's houses for years. Uh, some of our big name talent has had it so that we can you know, get them more often uh, for a daily show or whatever appearances. So there was some system, so we were just using those people a lot more while we had that set, uh, set up. As we progressed towards the draft, it had to, the decision had been made pretty early that uh, 
there was no way that we were going to be able to cover the draft like we always do from home. So uh, it was a came a co-production with ESPN where they utilized some of our talent, but mostly they produced it from because Connecticut wasn't shut down yet, so they were able to have a smaller footprint but still do do that. But that as it progressed though, we uh, contracted a control room in Oklahoma City where there were people pushing the buttons, but we were all on remote. So the director was on remote from their home. I was on the remote from my home. The graphics producer was on the remote. Everybody was on remote from home. And I was showing them earlier that it's a, there's a, a, an app where basically you can talk to everybody point to point. Uh, so there's one where the producer would have, be live where everybody could hear them. And then the producer can on their other device can point to point uh, or talk to just like in a control room, you push the buttons down to talk to in people's ears. Same thing, except it's on their phone. And it kind of makes you think about it more that, you know, once you have your daily meeting and, and you don't really, I mean, once the talent's on the floor, I mean, I'm I'm a five rooms away from them in, in studio, so I don't necessarily need to be face to face with them the, the way our setup is uh, in studio. So it's fine for me to be talking to them uh, that way. Uh, I do see that as we continue through the fall, I mean, that's when we, we really pick up. And even in July for training camp is when we really pick up. But uh, the adaptions that we've made this off season, I, I think we'll see that, that we can take those into the fall for, for many of our shows as well, probably. So speaking of the fall, um, Richard, what do, you, what do you see in terms of um, stadiums? Do you, do you envision um, having to uh, borrow sound, fan noises, or do you think that will be 20%? Uh, for example, um, our president, MS, uh, MSU President Stanley, uh, has, has mentioned maybe 20% capacity. Um, what is your prediction in terms of stadium fill? You know, I, I, as a, I in no way uh, represent the NFL in, in what their plan is, but they, uh, I, from what I've read and, and seen, uh, I don't know how we can have full stadiums or I don't even know how you can do, just from my, my opinion, looking at, at things, but again, not representing anything NFL related or not seeing anything in the NFL that from their perspective, um, I just, it's, it seems like it's going to be a difficult thing to do. I had noticed uh, like in, on a soccer broadcast, they were piping in, in noise on the I don't know if it was just the broadcast or if it was in the stadium as well, but uh, it's it's definitely we've had talks with our former players about how difficult that would be and the adjustments they would have to make because uh, on the field because it's it's not natural. You can hear people talking plays. You don't have there's no there's no home field advantage, um, so it's it's going to be be interesting to see how it, how it plays out. I'd seen a recent Twitter post. I think is it in Japan? Their baseball has come back, but the uh, the uh, fans have been replaced by stuffed animals. Did you guys? I think see it's South Korea, in Korea. Yeah. yeah, in Korea. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's a great photo. <laughs> I I saw a, a story on um, Brian Gumble show, and they interviewed a, a baseball player who was playing over there and they were talking about protocols. They can't spit, they can't touch each other on baseball players and, I, and, and they remarked about how, how unnatural that's going to be, not being able to spit in, in, in the field. Um, I wanna go to a couple questions submitted by an alum, Jessa, Jessica Mariko, and um, please chime in anybody. Um, if you could talk a little bit about um, your software uh, go, I, Richard, you mentioned a little bit of your software, but uh, if you can go into the particular apps you use for live streaming, Catherine, you mentioned Skype and um, WebEx. Uh, what, uh, what sorts of editing pivots have you, have you had to make? Mm -hmm. Richard, do you want to go? Or yeah, I sure, I, mean, I feel like I've just been talking for a while, but uh, I can go real quick. The, uh, the, we have a system that I had never heard of, but it's called Bebop, where uh, it basically linked into our stuff in Culver, so it could easily transition to a remote workflow. The editors work off their own edit systems at home. I'm not actually unclear. I assume it's the same ones they use in it's a home version of this one. They, they use Final Cut in, um, for the most part in studio. 
Um, and then they kind of send links out to everybody to see, we approve it, and then it gets sent out to the system in, in play out. But now that we're back in um, Culver for the most part, it just gets sent back to the original system that we had. There was a playout operator in Culver, so, who in which is uh, in LA where our system comes from. So, um, but it's been—I mean, the editors have been amazing. They've been busy. They've uh, and there hasn't really been a drop off in in a lot of the quality. Even our features team does features from uh, from home. We we have to. Uh, we're really concerned with security. Uh, the MPAA level of security, working with Marvel and all the major studios. Obviously, you know, narrative and story secrets of shows and movies are, are really, really important. Um, so going remote and thinking about security at the same time has been a big part of our shift. Um, we, we live inside the Office 365 ecosystem, um, which is approved as secure for us. So Teams is a huge app for us to communicate, have meetings, video conference, and also um, be able to interact real time with all of our remote editors. Like I say, we have 45 edit bays now remote in 45 different homes. Uh, we work on Avid and we had shared storage, which is no longer possible. So that's been, um, that's slowed down our process some. We've kind of gone old school where we have some runners that are um, taking hard drives <laughs> around town. Um, that's the most secure encrypted hard drives, being able to deliver directly to a home and have them uh, brought up through password on a secure system. But um, other apps we're using for production, um, our directors that are on staff are directing remotely through Zoom um, on iPads that are mounted, multiple iPads that are mounted around the set. Um, and Qtake is an app uh, that's essentially a remote streamable video village that allows um, live camera tap streams, um, all the metadata and script supervision notes can, can come through there. And anyone can log on to it um, as you would Zoom, and you can basically be sitting in Video Village. So all the clients, um, sometimes spread around the country, are on QTake, and then we have a parallel Zoom in which we can all communicate. And then there's some sidebar Zoom um, channels just for the director to speak to the crew. Um, but the footprint we're trying to keep on location is, is very small, like five people. Um, Do you think that will continue, where, where people around the country can just look at QTake? and not have to go to the set, if, especially if they're a kind of a fringe person anyway to have to be on set. That's right. And what we're finding is that just means more clients will be on at any one yeah. time. <laughs> now you can have 20 clients on, why not? Uh, so we'll see how that affects the process because there might be more opinions um, because right. it's so easy to be on set now. And I, I would agree that... Is that freeze just for me or is that for everybody? It's just Greg that's frozen. Yeah. We're back. All right. <laughs> okay. Catherine. Yes. Yeah. You, you're, uh, any changes in terms of editing or live streaming? Um, yeah. I mean, one thing with my show, I would never have used, like Skype would never have been acceptable for a guest, nor right. Cisco. Like there was a rule like, oh, even if a senator is available, it's like, well, we'll pre-tape versus having them on Skype. And how the, how the bar has gone down and how much money that saves actually with the show budget. The most expensive thing in a show budget is your studios and your live. And now we're doing it all. And the, actually the Cisco WebEx that we use is amazing. It looks great. Like that's a change that's going to continue. And, but we're still, because it's news, I'm still sending crews out. We just had a crew in Philly, you know, with, with the uh, protests we have, you know, there's a lot still going on. So we're still doing that. We're sending crews. I did send my anchor and he wore a mask and during the interview he did take his mask down for part of it and um, a lot of backlash on social media for that. But the, the sound bites that I had with the mask up I couldn't use because you couldn't understand you know what everybody was saying. So it's just interesting how things are changing in this whole dynamic but yeah. That, that, that is a great point about the, the quality because we're the same way, like no way with FaceTime, Skype. Never. Yeah, I mean it's, 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 it's opened up a lot of more guests as, as you mentioned. Um, and even like, uh, I did a show a couple weeks ago where uh, one of our, our analysts home cam, which is, you know, just normal video, uh, was out. And people were like, what are we gonna do? And said, why don't we just use Skype? And it was, it was fine, you know, but that, that would never have been in the front of mind option to, to we would have just lost them for the day. Right, and as producers, we think, oh, we can't do that, the quality, the viewer doesn't care. I think that person right. at home doesn't care. They see it and they know, yeah. 
which, which has been a tough adjustment to, to, to come to that, that uh, conclusion. Right. <laughs> and the money we're going to save is going to be the wave. Uh, are there differences, Catherine, between WebEx and Skype? Are there any? Um, yeah, WebEx is actually a lot clearer. I can't, technically, I, I'm not really, I'm an executive producer. I don't know the technical aspects of it. Maybe, Richard, you can jump in on that, why they're different. But I do find that WebEx, Cisco WebEx is much better. I think I think Cisco WebEx is a hardwired uh, system, whereas Skype is just like going on your phone or your computer to do it, not yeah. your Wi-Fi or whatever. And I find it's more um, with guests, it's harder for them to, it's harder for my bookers to explain to them how to get on Cisco WebEx versus Skype. That's the only reason that we sometimes do both. But as a network, we, we want first and foremost to do Cisco WebEx. So uh, another question that Jessica has is um, directing people on Zoom and Skype and FaceTime. Do you uh, direct them in terms of composition or lighting when you set them up for interviews? Um, that she wants to know, do you have any tips or tricks as to what, uh, what, what sources or interviewees um, should wear? It's always good, I mean, like we're doing here with this camera, you can always tell, and this is why, this is one of the reasons, Richard, I've never done it before. This is why you always say no to a guest on Skype or no, because you know what you're going to get. They're going to put themselves in a corner of a white wall with the camera going up their nose, right? And you right. bring a live program, you don't have time to kind of, I, my show, my anchor's based out of Philly. My I'm in New York, but my actual control room is in Atlanta. So sometimes with that disconnect, doing a Skype guest was like, all of a sudden they show up. And I can't talk to the guests, especially now during this search, uh, situation. Only Atlanta can. So when I see them, it's like live on air. So you don't want that camera going up their nose or anything. Just the common background. Everything's common sense, right? Color, a good background. But it's not always easy. But yeah, my and I think what, are the ones that really manage that. I also think what you saw just happen with Greg is one of the dangers of live TV that with this, this new system. Yeah. And you, luckily, we have two other panelists to talk. That's kind of what, what we build. So it's, all, it's not, never usually one and one is always a backup in case someone goes down in this in this environment or you know we have somewhere else to go to a tape or something so right. um that's that's a that's a, a major adjustment that we've had to make yeah and we don't always have backup the one time that happened to me that i had a fall i did have another guest as backup on coronavirus but there's times when you don't and the anchor has to tap dance you know which For is the amazing. cnn shows that because they were like when chris cuomo was in his house did they have a backup anchor on standby if his system went down you know what? I don't, I'm not sure. Usually we do. There's always been situations yeah. like that, but with nobody in New York, um, right. I mean, all, most, most of the anchors are all from home. Mm -hmm. It's rare. We, we've been shooting a lot of talent from their homes, especially right in, right when um, the pandemic hit and the and quarantine hit. Um, so we would have, uh, it, sometimes we'd be able to go in um, and set up a system in their backyard. And so we could set up the camera angle. We could set up the camera height. Oftentimes we're sending, uh, if we can't go to the location and, and control it, we'll send a set of recommendations, we'll send ahead USB um, ring lights um, and show diagrams of how to clip and mount on a laptop and what the height is. So that has definitely helped. Um, a lot of on-camera talent is sensitive to that anyway, so they have worked out their home systems to be um, ready for the right kind of background and that sort of thing. So. Um, but we did have, uh, we were able to send kind of portable kits that would work USB power to, to make sure they're lit. Um, and how much would those cost? Uh, they're not that expensive. We just kind of, we, we bought a handful of them, uh, you know, when we got into quarantine so we could send out. I mean, you can get a decent ring light with the clip to your thing for, you know, 30 bucks or something. So it's not, not too bad. But yeah, a little bit of ring light, uh, the right camera height, and a little bit of depth. That's kind of like the must-haves. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, a lot of anchors before this, my anchor has a setup at his home anyway. He just doesn't. Right. Have, it's not as ideal. Doesn't have prompter, so we still he he's been going to a studio in Philly the whole time, but um, right. he does have a setup at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we can go in and set up, it's nice. It's really we've um, set up in in people's backyards where it's open air, and then no one is no one is there. It's just the camera person and maybe one assistant setting up. Then we leave and the talent can come in and then they'll see us on Zoom and then we can, we, we have set it up so they can press record. <laughs> and then we can, we can direct remotely. Usually it's direct address, like we just did that for Gordon Ramsay um, in his backyard. So they can direct address and then hit, you know, pause and then he leaves and then we can come back and get the media from the good camera. So 
um, in the times where we can bring in proper gear, that's kind of how it works. Yeah. Yeah, you have a really nice you have provided standard procedures. I, I found something on uh, uh, Motion's uh, website that provides like your your change procedures in terms of. That's uh, right. Um, yeah, we put out we put out a, a kind of a white paper recommendation of yeah, how yeah. we're going to proceed in quarantine with production uh, called practicing safe sets, and uh, we uh, that has been really helpful to kind of lay out you know the top ten things that we're doing uh, that provide safety that give our client a sense of um, uh, security to consider shoots again, um, and then uh, we're constantly evolving and updating it. Um, you know, our head of production is looking at the how the how the rules are kind of unfolding and particularly in various states it's all at different stages you know we just did a remote shoot in texas um which feels very different where they're at um than say los angeles um so we're uh, we're having to track all of that but but communication is key we're, we're hoping to show people that it is safe and here here's how it is safe um and uh like i say it's just I think it's going to be small steps. And for a while, I think we'll be 10 or, 10 or less people on set with everything else remote for a number of months. Yeah, I also saw in your protocol that you're also going or shifting to um, tabletop uh, productions. Or yeah, just that's right. Productions. Um, so, but I, I need to get to the, the questions because there are a lot of questions coming in from Zoom. And yeah. this is from Elise Conklin. Hi, Elise. She says, hi, guys. I'm curious how you feel. These new work from home and other COVID protocols are going to affect production in the coming years. Do you feel like things are going to go back to how they were? Or has this innovation made your teams reevaluate future projects so we've talked a little bit a lot about that but anything more um what do you what uh, what is your crystal ball saying in terms of your productions are you going to go back to um back to the pre-covid times or have things evolved um so much so that we're going we have a new normal hmm. Catherine? Well, know, yeah Catherine, yeah, Catherine made a good point yeah i was going to say in the pre, pre what, what point Oh, about the rest of the year. Yeah, no, we're yeah. out for Jeff. Yeah, uh, Jeff Zucker. He said um, most of our staff is out till 2021. Now, my staff personally, they they're calling me wanting to come back in. They want to come in at least. They're dying to come back in. They they want to, and it's it is easier. It's frustrating. You're working from home. You're seeing the same four walls. They want to get back into the office. To be honest with you, um, but we're just it's just not safe yet. CNN has been amazing with like keeping everybody safe, and we just don't know. And but what it's amazing though is. I mean, we, we just, what, May, uh, Mother's Day, we moved into 30 Hudson Yards, an amazing space in Manhattan. We have five floors of, and here we all are working at home. So mm -hmm. who knows? I hope we get back. I, I personally want to get back to that environment, that creative environment. So I'm hopeful we can get back. But now that we know we can do it both ways, who knows? I don't have a crystal ball on it. I actually, and like I said, it was amazing how fast everyone said, oh, you can work from home. And I'm like, nope, I'm in the one industry. You cannot work from home. Right, communicate. We all we can't work from home. No, we have to be on set. We have crews. We travel, whatever, or we, you know, in the control room. And here it was a week, and we're all working from home. Yeah. Uh, on that point, though, I will say that one of the uh, this is maybe a little bit off the central question, but the impact of quarantine on the creative process. I, I do think that um, we've noticed just having to over communicate, over organize, yeah. and um, really check in with teams. Um, to keep morale up, to keep collaboration going. I think that being in a physical space when we're, we're writing and concepting and being creative um, and visually creative in particular, whether it's running into an edit bay to look at a cut of a trailer for a movie or to look at work with a storyboard artist or to sit in a writer's room and spitball, you know, concepts for Larry David's promo, like that, we call it doorway conversations, like the looseness of catching someone in a hallway or talking over lunch out, you know, on the patio or being able to run into a designer and look over their shoulder and say, oh, what if you move this over? Like all of that becomes like moving through a fog when it's fully remote, right? And so to keep the teams together, to keep collaboration and morale up and communication up, I feel like is a, it's a big lift for the creative leadership of, of our agency. Um, definitely have noticed that. So we look forward to that coming back. Um, and again, we'll probably, we're going to be in a phased comeback as well, because I think we're thinking only the essential people 
uh, that could benefit from being on location will come back to the office, like shared storage, editing, uh, the assistant editors and all that infrastructure would greatly benefit with, to returning to the shared storage system. Um, but we'll still have to socially distance the office. You know, our office was quite dense. And again, like for creative purposes, we designed the space to kind of interact and run into each other. And, 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 and that's what uh, um, next. So I feel like having to be a part is against the creative process a bit. Yeah. Go ahead, Richard. Next year, we're supposed to move into a new facility on the side of the new LA Stadium. There's a whole beautiful new building that they built and, and they're in the process of building. And they created a very open space like the one Craig's describing. And I'm interested to see if they, they redesign that before, you know, they're, they're the luxury of, of it's not fully completed yet. So they could probably adjust some things, but it's instead of like, very few offices, very much more community space. That's right. Um, and I'm, I'm interested. Is this the end of the open design. office plan, right? <laughs> right, right. So I'll be interested to see how that happens. Yeah. A lot of people invested in that. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's the open office plan. Well, walls, <laughs> maybe we'll have to come back. We'll yeah. If buy cubicle stock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or we'll all be wearing helmets, I think. Maybe. <laughs> So Greg, I have a question for you uh, from Zoom. It's from Ryan Hurst. Hi, Ryan. Uh, Greg, do you think there will be any long-term impacts on how films are released and exhibited post-COVID? Is PVOD here to stay? How will strategies for film marketing change? That's a good question. Something is, it's been on our minds and certainly the clients' minds. You know, you could say even before quarantine, uh, film going was already on the ropes uh, to some degree um, against streaming and all the kind of entertainment choices, including video games, but all, all kind of the home um, on demand choices for entertainment. Um, so much of our attention has been atomized by so many more choices. And, you know, the answer up to this point has been, you know, global franchises, um, big screen, um, uh, event movies, action, you know, the Avengers. Um, or, or just the Marvel Universe in general has really, uh, that model had taken us, you know, uh, so far, you know, in still going to the theaters, a reason to go to the theaters. I think that the big question is, how can theaters come back safely? What will they look like? Uh, just like stadiums, you know, is it, does it feel like it'll be safe enough for people to suspend their disbelief and relax, right? To, to kind of enjoy a movie and get lost in a movie, you have to feel safe. So with this kind of ever present sense of kind of medical concern, can you have an entertainment experience, right? Um, that, that's the big question. And just seeing how theaters come back um, will, will, will really be a, a true test. And when they come back, will people be ready and feel comfortable to come back? I think that um, one thing that has um, emerged already is the resurgence of drive-ins. We've seen that across the country um, and a number of our clients too have considered kind of special screenings in that environment. Um, there was just a premiere of a new film by Amazon that had in, um, multiple live events that were basically an Amazon sponsored um, uh, drive-in movie theater. So it was, it premiered on streaming and it was a streaming film. It was picked up at Sundance. It's called Vast of Night, but um, a big part of the promotion was quarantine safe drive-in uh, premiere um, and had multiple locations for that. So I think that we might see, uh, it, it's interesting that the streaming space is looking still for like some kind of community um, hook. Um, I do know there's been a real uptick in sharing, uh, sharing your streaming at home. That's another thing we've seen. Um, I don't know if others have seen on a plugin that you can do called Netflix Party that allows you to synchronize your playback. So you can actually have group screenings of things on Netflix and it's all synchronized. Uh, I know a number of the other streaming companies have looked at that. These are, these are all um, fast innovations that have happened within a matter of a month or two, right? Um, the question is, you know, how does cinema evolve? It, it requires a physical location. And that physical location, that's, that I think is the big challenge. So um, in terms of answers, I don't know that we have a lot. I think that there's been a lot of questions. In terms of how marketing might change, um, I, I don't know that the immediate, uh, in the immediate future, it's really about um, making 
marketing that um, makes the case for leaving your home to have a theater experience. I think theaters are thinking about how to market to the audience to say what you're missing. You know, the communal experience is a big part that is missing. And I think that um, we can all agree, going to a big screen, the lights go down, and if you're watching a comedy and the crowd is laughing, there's no better way to see a comedy. It, you can watch it at home, but it, the, you just can't get the same effect. So I think the, if there is any focus on marketing, it's, it's how theaters are talking about the experience, how theaters will market themselves to invite people back. Um, I think the movie Tenet, which is Christopher Nolan's new movie, is probably gonna be a, um, a big test when that comes out and then how it does in theaters. I think in, in our industry, that, that movie is, is probably, a, everyone is watching that film and seeing what happens. And the more that we're all working from home, we're gonna want that experience of going out more. That's right. Around people. Right. So, may, so maybe there is a future in the, yeah, that. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. But it is, it is, a, it is a strange time. Um, the entire film system has been shut down because the final step is a physical space, right? There have been experience, experiments where they've released first run movies for $20 online, you know, Pixar's um, Onward did that, um, Trolls World Tour did that. Um, the numbers that came back were decent, um, but I don't think they're on the scale of kind of a global band-aid release of a major franchise either, so. But if there is, you know, financial motivation, perhaps uh, we will see more first run at home. But I think it's all, all, everything is thrown up in the air right now. All of our clients are like, we're waiting, we're waiting. I think you've also answered Olivia York's question. Mm -hmm. I wanted to- Hi, Olivia. It, uh, I wanted to go to- She was one of our interns last year, so. <laughs> nice, thank you, yes. Olivia, for, for that. Yeah, right, There's a few more coming in from Zoom, but I wanna get to Catherine and, and Richard and then talk about um, like what have been the most challenging parts? Um, I guess physically, mentally, dealing with children at home. I apologize for my children walking in in the background. Yeah, my, my wife just came in for some reason now uh, where I'm working too. <laughs> my kid came in. I so. checked in at the window yeah. and I said, no, not yet. <laughs> yeah, which I tried to say that, but didn't get the hint, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so I think that, you know, as much as I don't please go fishing for an hour, you know, I say, so you have to like, just go with the flow. And, and now we're at a point in the psyche where you just got, you just go with it. So, so Catherine, like what are, what have been the challenges um, uh, in dealing with COVID, uh, both professionally and personally? Well, professionally, it's just hard not having your team around. You're trying to build a segment. You're trying to do sound bites, natural sound, and how you lead into it, how the copy goes, working with an editor that's far away and you know sending a sending the anchor and a crew but not sending a producer to shoot a piece and then you get the product back and you have to make something of it and everybody's working from home in different spots it's frustrating and then being in the control room and only having one person with you and everyone else at home on speakerphone or they're listening to the rehearsal on delay there's a lot that's coming at you and different so um yeah it's it's, it's tough i don't i don't think it's easy and you know they want to come back in you want to be with your coworkers. um my kids are older so uh, they're teenagers, so it's been okay with the kids at home. There's, I feel sorry for the people who have young children who are homeschooling and, and doing this. I feel fortunate. Uh, Richard and Greg, I think your kids are in different positions, so I feel a little bit lucky there. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's t I, I, wanna, I want life back to normal, but that's mm -hmm. yeah, I've been fortunate we have this, this back house uh, set up that I've been able to kind of get away from them, even if they try to come in occasionally. Uh, but there was one time where actually, uh, you know, after whatever, the 10th show, my son was watching kind of the production from the back, which was interesting for him. Uh, and then they had, we were pre-taping an interview with a player. And uh, I said to the player that, you know, my, you know my son, you're on my son's Madden team, at which my son talks about nonstop. And my son grabbed the mic and told him he was a 92 overall. Uh, in Madden, which was uh, uh, which was uh, a unique situation, and he, I, I immediately got and said this was the least professional thing I've ever done. But he, he said that he appreciated it. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was a, just you know, like what you were saying about your uh, Jerry about your son coming behind. People now anticipate that uh, on these all these home remotes, and even we've said to people if something happens like that, don't 
pretend it didn't happen, you know, embrace it. The viewer saw it. It's not, it's not a big deal. The, the level of, of, you know, perfection is, is, is not, not there and uh, not expected either. Yeah. And on I that point, we're no one thing we're noticing on social in particular, you know, we do um, a lot of social campaigns for our, the entertainment properties we're launching and the access, the sense of access in humanity and uh, to stars. So stars are we see the front room or they're in the corner of their bedroom and that sense of um, connection and access and shared humanity has actually been a real um, factor of engagement. Like the, the, the fans are, are really drawn to that. I know for Netflix, for example, uh, they're doing a lot of, instead of um, the shows because they can't shoot them, they're doing table reads of, of the scripts and those go through the roof in terms of viewership. Um, and it's just Zoom cameras and people reading scripts in their front room or their bedroom. So um, there's something about the kind of shared humanity or just the imperfection that's somewhat of, um, that's interesting, particularly when, you know, especially in entertainment, there's, there's sometimes like the glass screen between you and the star, right? So with that broken down, I think that's really engaged the audience. And, and during the NFL draft, that was a huge positive that the league took away from that. You saw all these coaches and GMs in their homes with their kids around them during the picks. And there was a positive uh, impact instead of, you know, these miserable guys in their offices, you know, in their quote unquote war rooms, what they call them and normally during a draft, they're at home, relaxed. And the show decided that, that, that people never got to see. It. And actually, because of that, for our schedule show, we, there was a big push to get a lot of people from their homes again reacting to that and we had 20 we had 29 guests which is was a was a bear but it was you know it, they they really wanted to show show things off and then you have things that were, are horrifying like um one of the coaches out, outside in his beautiful background but it looked like he was in witness protection because of the, the way the sun was and we just had to go with it and but you know and it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where he tried and you can only get him to do it so much and we have to get to the next interview anyway and it is what it is and and the people are, are, are more forgiving than, than they yeah. were in the past. I, I definitely recommend people Googling, um, was it Jimmy Kimmel? One of, one of the late night talk show hosts, their kids crashed his interview with Ethan Hawke and it's highly <laughs> <insane. laughs> yeah. Another thing that's good as an AP, it's always a booking war of who you can book. There's no excuses now. A senator's not available. <laughs> right. Saturday morning during <laughs> lockdown, doing? I'm like, we know where you are. <laughs> I'd always go back. Does he say, not have a cell phone? <laughs> yeah. So that's the, the thing too. I'd always like they have no excuse. I know that what they're doing. They're on lockdown. Yeah. Although they fa they maybe now that the excuse is oh my internet is my bandwidth is down. I just that's yeah. The, the new, that's the new. I'm not available. Yeah. <laughs> There's always some down. excuse. <laughs> yeah. So that's one of the questions I have for you, Catherine. Are you finding that it is easier to connect with um, politicians and other sources? And are you finding that um, shared humanity, it, being able to interview them in their, in their personal spaces? Yeah, as long as they can set it up. Sometimes that's intimidating for them as well. They don't like to set up their own, you know, Skype or, you know, Cisco. Um, we had Charles Barkley on this weekend. Um, we've had some good guests though. So they do it and, and it's actually, like I said, it's easier for me. I don't have to, normally you have to say, oh, can you do our interview? You have to go live, you have to do hair and makeup, we'll get you car service, you'll go to the studio. Now it's, you know, you can't say no, it's just you're, you know, you're gonna do it from your office, you're gonna turn on your computer and there you go. So it's easier. Mm -hmm. So uh, to uh, another Zoom question, it kind of relates to what we're talking about from Chris Brzezinski, I'm sorry, Chris, if, if I mispronounce your last name. Um, you wrote, I have become more tolerant of what I would have called poor production values in the days before COVID. Now, uh, when I see a segment with poor production values, I am not only more tolerant, but also sometimes amazed that the producer has actually managed to get the segment on air, if at all, given all the challenges. How do you see this possible new level of audience tolerance and newly developed quick production skills affecting cost, ease, and effectiveness of production. I think in addition to um, kind of us getting used to it, the younger generation's been used to it for a few years with Stitch and YouTube, yeah. and and that's that's kind of made it so that their pressure's less to make. They don't that the poor production values is what they're used to. A couple years ago, I worked on this. Um, 
event in Las Vegas with this guy Ninja, uh, who was doing a Fortnite um, tournament, basically. And they, and we try to make it fancy and, and, you know, but, you know, he's, he, he was always just from his basement doing it, one of these Zooms and, and playing. And when we tried to make it fancy, the reaction was terrible. They didn't want to see it that way. They want to see it what they're used to, which is the personal uh, camera right on in the whole time. They don't need to flash away from the game or, flat, you know, make it a big event. And that was a learning experience. And I think that that's a real takeaway for, for the future as well, is that, that people aren't expecting there's a there's a professional level that you need to get to be at, but once in a while it's okay to to kind of take a step back and take a step down the, the, the production value. We find the same thing. Um, the rules of social um, campaigns, um, maybe that is expanding to other um, parts of the media landscape. Um, I think you're pointing to, especially with a certain generation, the authenticity. Uh, like user generated, like the low production value user generated shot on an iPhone is is associated with authenticity and directness and access and realness. And and like if you do try to dress up a social campaign with production values, like Hollywood production values, um, it's seen as inauthentic um, and is often shunned or not really viewed or shared. So I think that there is some of that maybe expanding beyond just sort of the, the social rules. I mean, that's that those have been the rules for many years, just in our social campaigns. I think we're seeing it go beyond. And I think the, the financial implication is, you know, especially in the reality programming, uh, an article just came out about um, some of the shows that Food Network and Discovery and, you know, those reality based programs, they're not really seeing a drop in viewer interest with the this new method of shooting from home or having lower production values and they they quoted it as saving up to 300k an episode so i think when you see when you see that i i would imagine that at least in the reality space that some of these production values may stay for for budget reasons it's a real savings yeah i think people in our industry we care about it and we look for it but the normal a normal viewer doesn't mm -hmm. yeah when in, when at that time you know like a, a reality based program already was available light and you know documentary style so maybe that you know one click to over to a zoom camera really people don't notice yeah so the the decrease decrease in in the number of people that you have in your studios it's i i'm just thinking of students um what can they do to prepare themselves in, say if they're graduating to now or in the next year or so to um, really distinguish themselves coming into this new environment of production. Uh, yeah, I mean, I th yeah, I, th I think it, it is evolving and, but you still need the same skills that you always needed coming out. You know, if you, you just be as well-rounded as you can, learn edit systems, have a great attitude, like we still need to hire people. It's, it's that's not gonna change. Um, and I think that, that you know, it, it may be less people at, at first as well. We, we are in this, but it's going to get back at least in, on, on that level, I think, to, to a more normal. Yeah, I would say it's probably going to initially be more competitive because there's been such a contraction in the industry, at least from the, our standpoint of until we see full production return for films and, and shows, there's definitely a contraction in the industry, so it's gonna be more competitive, but I would agree the skill set is the same, the craft is still the same. Um, if there was one area that I think probably will um, be more, maybe if there was one area to more to focus on would be communication. I feel like um, communicating, um, the written communication, communicating well over uh, video, I do think there's a, like I mentioned before, there's, uh, in our leadership, there's, you know, a real uptick, we've talked a lot about over communicating or communicating even more clearly or succinctly into the system that is remote. I mean, we've, everybody is remote, so the, the clearer the communication, the more we can bring back our process and our flow. So I don't know, I think that's become even more important. You know, um, connecting the teams and managing teams and communication has, has come to the fore to, to keep, the, keep the thing rolling. Verbal communication. Yeah, I would say verbal communication and presenting yourself in this context, you know, I mean, um, particularly among creative teams. And I'm speaking, you know, uh, specifically around, you know, the, the unique challenge of keeping a creative team connected and inspired and collaborative. 
um, you know, creatives can, um, I think creatives are suffering probably more than most from a personality perspective, just because, you know, they, the creative process thrives on this kind of community and, and connection and physically being in the same space and spitballing and, and kind of that, that collaboration is, uh, cr requires much more effort in, in the communication and the leadership side. Um, so, and that's on Zoom or email or any of the communication we're doing. It's all mediated now. So, Focus. Catherine? Yeah, my advice, you know, it's hard. It's a hard time right now, but if, if, if you can get those internships as much as you can get that experience, even if it is at home, as many as you can figure out what you like, you know, get to know people. It's, it's hard to get in the door. I don't, I mean, Greg and Richard, if you agree or not, but once you're in the door as an intern, you start doing the job I and mean, it's easier to get hired. I mean, it's just, it's a hard time okay. right now for graduates. It's always my number one advice is internships. I was Anything. fortunate to have, I think, five in college, and that it varies your experience and makes you a qualified candidate. It, uh, it's more than anything you can do in the classroom. Right. Um, build the resume. I mean, sometimes small shows, they need, you know, if I hire a PA, I already need them to be able to cut video and sound right. like, build yep. graphics. It's very, you know, basic stuff. It's like a vocational education, but wait, this person can get off the ground running. That's what you want. So it's not even, so that's, those are the, it's crucial. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I would say on that point, probably because um, initial hires may continue to be remote, being self-sufficient right. and proactive in mm -hmm. that way, you know, is going to be critical. You know, oftentimes with interns or, or people just starting out, there's a lot more, you know, direct interaction on a daily basis. But I think that will be replaced more by check-ins. And so the more you can feel like um, you're taking initiative and, and being self-sufficient, it's, it's going to be a big value. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. It is 12.59. Uh, Catherine, Richard, Greg, thank you for an opportunity. That went by it so fast. I know. <laughs> All done, can you believe it? Um, so appreciate you joining us from the coast. Um, uh, Meredith, did you have a few words before we sign off from the Midwest? Yes, thanks, Jerry. Just a really quick wrap up and thanks so much to our audience for attending this really superbly produced webinar, given everything that we've just heard today. <laughs> Jerry, thanks for being a fantastic moderator and you guys for being a fabulous panel. We appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, and we look forward to providing you with future ComArt Sci Talks. So next week, we are revving things up with the conversation about the auto industry on Tuesday, the 16th at noon. So watch your inbox for a follow-up email, a survey, and other coming attractions. And thanks again, everyone, and go green. Oh, I <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks, really guys. appreciate it.